Bruchem Aboim. Again, welcome to our home. Thank you for attending. Again, we are on the um, series for the Shimon Rastri for the Amida. So, again, this is a deeper understanding of the Amida too. So, this week on my thoughts, I'd like to begin our in-depth journey through the blessing in the Amida with the first blessing, Mogin Avram. Uh, prayer is so closely identified with our forefathers that it is often referred to as what we call davening. This word is connected with the Aramaic term davuon, which means of our fathers. You know, the Rambam and in Hilchas Tefillah, chapter 10, stated that the first three blessings of the Amida are one unit, and if they are not recited proper con concentration, proper kavana, one must repeat them. He then adds that since that may cause a difficulty for most people, one should at bare minimum recite the first blessing with proper concentration. The Talmud in the Tractate of Brachot teaches that prayer without proper intention is like a body without soul. In the first chapter of Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of the Fathers, Shimon Atzadik stated that the world stands on three things, Torah, Avoda, and Gemilat HaSadim. Now, Torah, this again, which alludes to the Torah of study, pardon me, the study of Torah, the service of God and our prayers, and the performance of acts of kindness. These three concepts correspond to our forefathers. Torah alludes to Yaakov Avino, Jacob our father. Prayer alludes to Yitzhak Avino, Isaac our father. And deeds of kindness allude to Abram Avino, Abraham our father. Each one of these three, first three prayers in the Amida allude to one of our forefathers and their special connection to God Almighty. Now, one should begin every Amida that they recite by taking three steps forward, if they, as if they are approaching God Almighty to pray. The prayer is then recited in its entirety while standing erect with both feet together. This alludes to the service of both the priest as they served in the temple and the angels as they stand in prayer before God Almighty. As we conclude our Amida prayer, one should take three steps backward, bowing three times. Once to the left, once forward, and then to the right. This was the protocol that one would employ when taking a leave of a king. Since a person never turns their back on a human king, one certainly should not do so when standing before God Almighty, the King of Kings. So let us begin our discussion with the opening words that introduce all of the Amida prayers. The Amida opens with the words, Adonai Sif Sifasai Tiftach, which translates to mean, My Lord, open my lips. Now, with these words, we are requesting that God, our Father in heaven, grant us permission to address him. We are, so to speak, standing on the outside, and we are about to enter into the presence of God Almighty, our benevolent Father in heaven. You know, a good friend of mine, Rip David Poulter, mentioned to me that the first letters of the first three words in this introduction are Aleph, Shin, and Tuf. They form an acronym for the Hebrew words Ashes, which means the wife of. We are told by our sages that at the giving of the, to that the, giving of the Torah to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai was seen as the marriage between God Almighty and the Jewish nation. That being the case, by Jewish law, a husband has certain responsibilities to his spouse. You know, the Hebrew words chassan and kala, bride and groom, have the same gematria, the same numerical value as the Hebrew words chesed ve'emet, kindness and truth, 513. This fact is not an accident. It is also the gematria. The numerical value of the Hebrew words is zug men hashemayim, a partner is chosen from heaven. That the spouse that we choose is not arbitrary. It has already been ordained from heaven. The only person that you can truly extend chesed and emet to is a spouse. Since whenever you do a kindness for any other person, it creates some sort of sadness or regret, since in some way they feel that they are now indebted to you. However, a spouse feels that they deserve anything and everything that you give them. In that being the case, there is therefore no negative feeling or regret 
associated with acts of kindness that you shower upon them. So as we begin our prayer, we open our lips and begin to address God Almighty. We remind him that he married us at Mount Sinai when he, we received the Torah. Therefore, we should be privy to special kindnesses. These introductory words are a plea to God Almighty that he should open up our lips. We ask him to remove any and all physical barriers that impede our ability to have a dialogue between the divine that resides within us and the divine that resides all around us. God's greatest gift to mankind is the power of intelligent speech. This opening verse is taken from Psalm 51:17. In this psalm, we beseech God Almighty to not only open our mouths in prayer, we acknowledge that we have the privilege and the responsibility to yagid, to hilosecha, to declare your praises to others. As we state in the Modim prayers, no delucha, that we thank you for all the blessings that you bestow upon us. But thanking God in reality is not enough. The blessing continues in the saper to hilosecha, that in addition, we need to tell other people about all your praises. So we have an obligation to be God's advocate in this world. If we fulfill our obligation in this world, then he will be our advocate in the world to come. The prayer opens with the Hebrew word Baruch, which is translated as blessed. Rav Chaim of Elijah in Nefesh HaChaim stated that this translation is incorrect. Saying that the word means praised or blessed is not a proper description of God Almighty. God does not need our praise or our compliments. Reb Chaim contends that a more precise translation of the word Baruch is to increase, expand, or intensify. All of these words are connected to the Hebrew word Berecha, which means to spring. When we use the word Baruch, so we are in essence proclaiming that God Almighty is the source of all of our blessings. The word Baruch is also connected to the word Berach, which means knee. We introduce ourselves with a bow before we begin our personal audience to God, our Father, our King. As we recite the word Baruch, we bend our knees before him as a sign of reverence and humility. The Talmud the Tractate of Brachot states that we bow four times in the Amida. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, bows at the beginning and the end of each of the blessings. The king bows at the first word, Baruch, and remains bowed until the last word in the Amidah, Shalom. The Talmud states, for he is bent over by the weight of his gratitude. The greater the man, the greater the humility. The next word is Atta, you, which is said in the second person. As you pronounce the word, we bend over from the waist. The privilege of addressing God with the word Ata, you, has been given to us as his chosen people, as it states in the Tractate of Yuma. Beloved are Israel, that they, are require, that they require no intermediary. Therefore, let us utilize this word with proper awe and respect. As you recite the next word, Hashem, we return to an upright position. This is done as a sign of respect. This is the only name of God that we do not have permission to recite as it is written. It is referred to as the ineffable name of God. It denotes the kindness and mercy that we, <clears throat> excuse me, connect with God, our benevolent Father in heaven. The next words are Elokeinu Elokeavoseinu, our God and the God of our forefathers. We begin our prayer with the word our God, since we as individuals are obligated to serve him to our fullest abilities. On the other hand, we acknowledge that the reason that we were chosen by God was not due to any action or merit that we possess. He chose us only because we are the descendants of our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. As it states in Kohelet and Ecclesiastes, a three-braided cord is difficult to break. So they set a chazaka, a precedent for us that is not easily broken. Maral of Prague foretold that according to the divine plan of history, most Jews in the pre-Messianic era will be irreligious and estranged from the Torah legacy of their forefathers. Ultimately, 
these lost Jews will make an independent decision to repent and return to their heritage. This chain of events is necessary, explains the Maharal, because if all Jews would serve God Almighty only because they accepted the word of their parents, their service would be mechanical, routine, and lifeless. God wanted the children of Israel to greet the Messiah with a certain level of enthusiasm that can only be attained through personal inquiry, struggle, and hard-earned discovery of the truth. The blessing continues with the names of our forefathers preceded by the name of God, el the God of Abraham, the God of Yitzhak, and the God of Yaakov. The question that comes to mind is, why is the name el the God of repeated before the name of each of the forefathers? The prayer could have just begun with the word el and then listed each of the patriarchs. So why is it that the name of God is repeated before each of their names? This teaches us an important lesson, that each one of our forefathers were innovators. They each served God Almighty with their own unique trait. Avram Avinu with kindness, Yitzhak with severity and discipline, and Yaakov who succeeded in developing a trait that blended the essence of both his father and grandfather, referred to as Tiferet and Emet beauty and truth. You know, God Almighty does not expect us to be a carbon copy of each other, even an illustrious person. It is his desire that we serve him with our own uniqueness. We do not learn from, pardon me, we do learn from others, which helps us to develop who we need to become. In a sense, we are all pieces of a, a jigsaw puzzle that makes up the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. If you have two pieces that are identical, well, the second piece is useless. It serves no purpose. It can be discarded. We all need to become and stay relevant. There is another reason as to why the forefathers are mentioned in the opening prayer of the Amidah. It states in Moran Devuchim that this is also one of the principles of which the Torah depends, that all the good that God did for us in the past and will do for us in the future is in the merit of our fathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov who kept the way of God to do righteousness and justice. As it states in Mishle in Proverbs, forsake not your friend, nor the friend of your father. This verse can be understood on two levels. Forsake not your friend, meaning that if someone is your friend, and in addition, he was a friend to your father, he has passed the test of two generations and can be trusted. The love of the father guarantees the love of the son. In addition, the verse instructs us not to forsake our responsibility. It is incumbent upon us to show gratitude to such a friend and their relationship. There are times when we are all, need of, all in need of a friend. Joy with a friend is doubled, and sorrow is cut in half. The three forefathers represent the spherot. There were ten characteristics that God Almighty employed in creating this world. The first three traits are intellectual. They are referred to as Chabad, which is an acronym for Chachma, Bina, and Dat, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. The remaining seven traits are all emotional, six that are masculine, and the last trait, Malchut, kingship, is feminine. The first blessing in the Amid is dedicated to Avinu, Abraham, our father. He was the paradigm of kindness. Abram Avinu, Abram, our father, represents the trait of chesed, kindness, the first of these emotional traits. He emulated God Almighty, whose desire in creating this world was stated in Psalm 89.3, which states, Olam chesed yibaneh, that God created this world for kindness. In addition, Abram Avinu was the first person in creation to spread monotheism throughout the world. Yitzhak Avinu, Isaac, our father, was the paradigm of severity and discipline. He is perceived as the toughest of the fathers. Even though he fought no battles, the king of the Philistines, Avimelech, saw him as a possible threat to his nation. He therefore suggested that they should join together in a peace treaty. Yitzhak had the strength of character to go against his nature and bring up an Asa in his house even allowing Aesop's wives to burn incense to their idols in his home. According to some commentaries, it was that smoke from those idols that caused him to go blind in his later years. He could have easily thrown Aesop out of his house, but he went against his nature, and by doing so, 
he was able to influence his wayward son to be better than he would have been otherwise. Yaakov Avino Jacob, our father, is seen as the greatest of the forefathers. He personified the traits of Tiferet and Emet, truth and beauty. As it states in the book of Micha, Titain Emet Liakov, he gave truth to Yaakov. The word give, Titain, is used here since truth is not something that a man can acquire by his own powers. This was a gift from God Almighty which continues for his descendants. Yaakov was able to incorporate for his descendants. Again, Yaakov was able to incorporate the best of both his father and grandfather. We are called by his name, the Nei Yisroel, the children of Israel. The prayer continues with the words, Hakel, Hagado, Hagibor, Vahanora, the great, the mighty, and awesome God. You know, these four words connect to the four remaining traits that God Almighty has taken upon himself when he created this world. Again, the hymn, which is Netzach, victory, hod, splendor, yesod, foundation, and malchut, kingship. The highest form of praise is imitation. When we recall these praises of God Almighty, we must resolve to follow his example. As it states in the Talmud in the tractate of Shabbat, Avedom Melo, that we should emulate him. The prayer continues with the words, Kel El Elyon, the God that is most high. The word Elyon means that God Almighty is so exalted that he is far above any co human comprehension or even the highest of angels. We can only know him through his deeds, uh, this amazing, world, magnificent world that we are blessed to live in. Gomel chasodim tovim kone hakol, that God bestows good kindness and he possesses everything. You know, there's nothing in this world that we receive that is not a gift from God Almighty, our Father in heaven. All that exists in this world is his possession. Success belongs to God. All that we contribute is the effort. With every benefit that, we, that a person receives, they become more and more indebted to their benefactor. There is no way for us to repay his kindness. This fact alone should make us more and more humble before him. Zocher chaste avot. And he recalls the kindness of our forefathers. The Talmud in the tractate of Shabbat stated that the merit of our forefathers have lost their ability to protect their descendants. However, Isaiah said that if we emulate their kindness, then God Almighty will always remember us favorably. The Maral of Prague stated that this is precisely the purpose of prayer. Even if our sinful ways have obliterated the merit of the patriarchs, sincere prayer will once again bring those merits back to life. Kindness is the root of divine service. We may be goel of Nebin Nehem Laman Shemo, and he brings a redeemer to their children's children for the sake of his name. These words are written in the present tense to tell us that redemption is not a one-time event in history, but that it is an ongoing process that is occurring right now. Every event that has been part of our history, both good and bad, is actually one step forward towards the ultimate redemption of the coming of the Mashiach. The paragraph ends with the word bi'ahava, which means with love. Everything in this world Everything goes back to love, love of God and love of man. One cannot love God unless they love his children. The second temple was destroyed because of the sin of sinas chino, baseless hatred. The Messiah will come when we can generally love our neighbor, avas chino, baseless love. The Arizal teaches that one should begin their morning prayers with the declaration that I accept upon myself to the ahafta the riacha komocha to love my friends as I love myself. We recite our prayers in the plural tense to demonstrate that we are concerned not only for ourselves, but we are also concerned about the needs of others. The Talmud in the Tractate of Babakama states that anyone who prays for his fellow man, his prayers are answered first. The ending sentence in the prayer begins with the words, Melech, Ozer, Umoshia, Umogain. The king which is a term which alludes to a leader who rules 
his people by their choosing, not by means of his coercion, who helps us, saves us, and shields us. He helps us before any difficulties arise. Then when we are in the midst of troubles, he saves us from destruction. And finally, when all else is lost and we find ourselves in the depths of despair and there seems to be no salvation, it is he who protects us and shields us from any further harm. The Lev Elio stated that when God Almighty acts as a helper or savior, he does so through natural, conventional methods. However, when he acts as our shield, then he employs supernatural means to protect us. The prayer ends with the words, Baruch Atah Hashem, Mogein Avram. Blessed are you, God, the shield of Abraham. As we recite the word Baruch Atah Hashem, we bow a second time before God Almighty. These words are connected to God's assurance to Avram, our father, after he was victorious over the four kings who had taken Lot, his nephew, as a captive. Where God said to Avram Avinu, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Now, although all the patriarchs are mentioned in this prayer, the prayer ends with only the name Avram. One reason given is that he was the trailblazer. He set the example for his son, grandson, and all future descendants to follow. Another reason given as to why the prayer ends with the words, the shield of Avram. Avram Avinu's trait was kindness. Just as being kind is a, just as being unkind is a fault, so to being indiscriminately kind can also be a fault. So in this prayer, we are requesting that God Almighty should even protect us from an overabundance of kindness, since that too may be detrimental to our well-being. We don't turn the other cheek. We have a belief based on the Torah that if someone is coming to kill you, well, get up early and kill him first. An example of this concept is the Six-Day War. Other commentaries see the Hebrew letters of the word Mugain, shield, mem, gimel, and nun as an acronym for the protection of our mummo, our money, goof, our bodies, and our neshamot, our souls. I know this is a great deal of information, but it is my hope that you will find it all interesting, informative, and inspiring. Next week, with the help of God, we will hopefully continue with the second blessing in the Amida. Let us all pray to God Almighty that he brings a swift and victorious end to the war in Gaza with the complete defeat of Hamas and all the evil in the world. May he bring about the safe return of all the hostages, cure all the sick and injured, comfort the mourners, and return all the brave IDF soldiers home safely, led by Mashiach Sukainu quickly and in our time, then let it be now. Again, thank you for attending. Again, God should bless you and yours with only good, safety, health, and uh, happiness. Again, please make sure that you, if you haven't done so already, subscribe, push the like button, and please share this with your friends if you find it to be interesting. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.